Center, my name is Vesalan Jungic and I'm a deputy. Uh, the main idea of Dermac Center Series SFU Research Masterclass is to have a group of prominent SFU researchers that will, instead of an academic lecture on their research topic, tell the story of their research path and the best practices. The format of each event is a sit-down session with an interviewer rather than a standard presentation format. This is followed by a question and answer with the audience. Our today's interview is, interviewee is Dr. Powell Hell, a professor of computing science at Simon Fraser University. The interviewer is Crystal Go, a PhD candidate at the Department of Mathematics. Crystal completed her Bachelor's of Mathematics, Honors Combinatorics and Optimization Cooperative Program, and Honors Pure Mathematics with the distinction at the University of Waterloo in 2009. Crystal obtained her Master's of Mathematics, Combinatorics, and Optimization under the supervision of, the, of Dr. Christopher Gottsil in 2010 at the University of Waterloo. In 2013, Crystal was a finalist at the SFU three-minute th thesis competition. And uh, Crystal's Erdash number is two. So, Crystal, all the team. Thank you, Veso. So it's my honor today to have a conversation with Dr. Pavel Hill, whose Erdős number is one, by the way, <laughs> just so we're clear. And um, he's a very well-known uh, researcher in the field of graph theory and also optimization. He's so well-known that um, one of my friends during my master's wrote his master's thesis on Hogvist and Hell graphs, named after Pavel. So, and today we're going to talk about how he came from a metallurgy trainee to SFU professor. So, so how, how did you uh, <laughs> make this transition? So I have to explain, uh, when Vesso asked me to do this, my, my uh, first thought was to title this something like the random path of a scientist. And then the first speaker chose a title very much like that. <laughs> and so I thought, well, how did I come to this mathematics career? And then Rina chose that uh, title with slight modification. So then I, I was working hard to find something that would attract, uh, attract people. And uh, you, know, you have to take this with a bit of poetic license. I, I'll explain. When I finished elementary school, that was late 50s, in uh, communist Czechoslovakia, it was, uh, my parents concluded inconceivable for me to go to the university and therefore it would be best to provide me with some kind of career so that I, I don't have to dig ditches when I uh, <laughs> And by coincidence, the uh, Warsaw Pact countries have decided at just that time to build a huge metallurgical manufacturing complex in eastern Slovakia, just next to my hometown of Košice. And so the government opened a new technical high school to train metallurgy workers and technicians. Uh, it was actually, I was actually in the first uh, year that the high school accepted students. And by the way, by coincidence, this is the last year they're closing next year. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, about metallurgy. It wasn't exactly a trade school. We, we had some academic uh, topics, subjects. Uh, we had mathematics for the first two years out of the four years, and uh, a little bit of physics as well. Chemistry maybe was the most uh, important subject from the sciences. And then there was a lot of practicum. So I did actually train a smelter and uh, did spend um, months in, in this practica. I didn't like it, and I, I tried to move to topics I felt I was missing by not going to a real high school. So I entered any math competition Olympiad I could find, and I joined a, a filmmaking uh, club, amateur filmmaking club, and I tried to read on art and history, all the things I, I wasn't exposed to in, in high school. And then how did we get to math? Well, um, in the intervening four years, the political situation slightly improved. It was not inconceivable anymore that I wouldn't be allowed to go to university, but now I didn't really have the right education for it. 
And so I applied to the two. Um, first of all, I wanted to go to Prague. And the two best schools in Prague that I was interested in were the film school and the mathematics uh, physics faculty. And both are very famous schools in East European context, the Central European context. So I applied to FAMU, the film school, and I applied to Charles University. And um, now in retrospect, looking back, it was very naive of me. I had no portfolio of films. I looked recently at who was accepted that year in FAMU. So uh, of the Czech directors, Menzel and Foreman were a few years earlier. <laughs> But it uh, uh, just shows how naive I was. The, uh, the school served other Slavic countries, and uh, Jura Jakubisko was accepted that year, as was Goran Paskalievich and uh, Agnieszka Holland, who probably most of you know. So uh, it was a very good school. I, I stood no chance. <laughs> and. Uh, to my surprise, I was accepted in the mathematics physics faculty of Charles University, the best math school in the country. I couldn't understand. I had no portfolio, I thought. But then later I discovered that uh, the people who were marking the math Olympiads and math competitions were actually faculty from the universe, best universities. And there were some in Charles University that remembered my name. And uh, that's how I got to study mathematics. My name is unusual even in Czechoslovakia, so they didn't remember, remember the name. So it's at Charles University that you met your future collaborators, Jaroslav Nesetrel and Vasek Kvatel. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and you guys um, all came to Canada at some point, yeah. around the same time? It, it was, of course, 1968 when the uh, Warsaw Pact countries invaded Czechoslovakia. We were in the fourth year. So uh, in, my, in my class, I was lucky to have a very strong group of peers. And if I have one advice for graduate students, this is the environment you are looking for. It's nice to have a strong supervisor, but it's equally nice to have a strong group of peers who will pull each other to uh, accomplish uh, something important. And uh, in my group of seven students, uh, I will name some names, only mean something to some of you. There was Vasek Hvatal, there was Jarek Nešetřil, and there was Ludje Kučera, all three people still active in this kind of area I am working in. And then there were two others that are still very good scientists, and there was a a woman who was very strong in mathematics, but who became famous for marrying Václav Benda, who was a well-known dissident and is the mother of uh, Mark Benda, Marek Benda, the current Czech politicians. So it was a kind of a very competitive, strong group of graduate students. And then in the fourth year, we just came back from army training, and uh, then the invasion happened. Jari Neshetri and I traveled together uh, for a summer job in Holland. On the way back, we stopped in Vienna and we met Vasek Hvatal, who said, I am going to Canada. So, <laughs> we're easily influenced and, uh, and we followed. So, you all came to Canada to do your Three masters? Three of us came to Canada. I see. Um, and at that time, graph theory was a pretty young field. I mean, it still is compared to algebra and analysis, but it's somewhat more established now. Um, but it was really young when you first came to Canada in the 60s. So what was it like to develop this new field? So let me first uh, remember uh, that in Vienna, because we didn't want to come on immigrant visas, we wanted to come on student visas, not to preclude the possibility of returning to Czechoslovakia. Uh, we made the contact with a graph theorist in Vienna by the name of Itzbitsky. Now, I don't know, Peter has studied in Austria, he might not remember, but uh, he uh, suggested that for the time being we join, uh, we uh, enroll in the university in Vienna, and so we became students of Professor Hlavka. And Hlavka, uh, Hlavka's students include uh, 
Maurer and everybody who is in combinatorics in, in Austria. So this was a very good uh, kind of introduction for us. And through these people, we met our future advisor at McMaster, Gerd Sabidusi. Now, this was a group of algebraists, a group of Austrian-German algebraists at McMaster, Banaszewski, Bruns, Behrens, Sabidusi. Some came from Germany, some already spent some years at Tulane and, and then joined McMaster at that time. So graph theory at McMaster was really just Gerd, and uh, he was very algebraic. This was kind of from an algebraic perspective. But at that time, Vasek Kvartal was already at Waterloo, and so we did spend a lot of time at Waterloo, and I remember the exciting atmosphere of Waterloo, of both professors and graduate students. They had a really strong group. And, you know, the, the likes of Bill Todd and Nash Williams and Murty Edmonds. Jack was already a controversial figure at uh, Waterloo at that time. Uh, and, of course, Adrian Bonding. So it was a core group of strong graph theory at Waterloo with very little maybe outside of that. There was a small focus in Edmonton, Abbott, and Moon and Moser and at McGill, but otherwise it wasn't really a very uh, popular field. It was a young field at that time. Okay, so um, part of the 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 idea of this uh, master class is to try to understand researchers more, and I think the most interesting question is why do you do research in graph theory today? Okay, so uh, I guess my colleagues will confirm that I, I'm not very good at socializing. <laughs> I don't stand by the water cooler or the coffee machine and chat with people. So for me, really doing research is the social outlet, uh, getting with a group of bright uh, postdocs and graduate students or with the colleagues whose way of thinking I know this is the fun, that's the fun in research life. This is how I decided to do science. And uh, well, I thought of a few kind of random memories of how feeling the social, feeling the pleasure from the social interaction doing research together. So in Prague, we, all of us had a common kind of mentor a uh, professor of, uh, I guess he was in analysis, whose name was Hederlin. And Hederlin chose the few better students from the class. We were maybe 300 because the high school teachers also were our classmates. And said, we'll just every Friday come and we'll sit and talk about problems. Now, don't think that those were really complicated problems. They were just kind of first exercises in graph theory, but we had not been exposed to any of it. And so we would sit Friday afternoon, he would bring a bottle of uh, Algerian red wine, and, and we sat there and drank and chatted, and really we hadn't solved any big problems or even came close, but uh, we all learned how much fun it is to do research together and to offer ideas and to ask questions. And uh, I think that had a big influence on me. The second time where actually active research was done, and this is these three other people I mentioned, Vasek Vatel, Jarek Nešetri, Ludek Kučera and I, have decided, listening to some Hederlin lectures, that this particular aspect of the problem hasn't really been solved. So let's meet in Slovansky Dům, which was a nice, beautiful Art Deco cafe, and we ordered a bottle of Sotern, and we sat there until we solved that problem. And then, uh, you know, each of us wrote a little piece of the paper, and that was really my first paper, and my first collaboration, and that was really a lot of fun. So throughout my career, I guess moments like this were you get together with other people and uh, work on something jointly. That really was the thrill, the social thrill for me. I had a good group of graduate peers at McMaster. 
I don't know how many people from the math department are here, but uh, the, the algebraic, uh, you know, the algebraists at McMaster are really a strong group. And my graduate student peers include people from there, like Evelyn Nelson, you probably know because there is a fellowship named after her, and Alan Day and Bill Shelter, uh, and I on the rival. Uh, and so I felt the thrill of uh, um, peer pressure and interaction at McMaster. But I think the uh, nicest then was uh, getting a first job at SFU because uh, that was the group of Brian Alspa. And uh, there was a very active group that somehow still managed to continue and is thriving now with uh, Boyan here, and Matt, and Lazzo, and Peter, and Luis, that really still is. So if you are in that group, I think you are lucky. This is still one of those places that is alive and, and doing well. Let me just uh, put a plug in here for myself. When we, Brian and I started uh, kind of holding seminars on the West Coast, I, that's the time I first learned about the Indian tradition of potlatch, the First Nation potlatch. And I suggested that name. And uh -huh. The potlatches have still, you know, they still continue to this day. We are going to a potlatch this uh, Saturday in Bellingham. Okay. Um, so you mentioned collaborating with other students and, uh, and, and colleagues. So for me, there was a point when collaboration changed for me. So in my early um, math days in undergrad, when we were collaborating as a group, it was like one person was teaching all the other people. But then eventually, um, there came a situation where I was actually doing research with someone, or I was actually solving a problem at the same time as someone in conjunction. Was it like this for you? I would say that was probably that uh, first time when four of us got together in Slovansky doing work together. We realized we each had something to bring. Uh, but, uh, you know, often I found that in collaborations, uh, so there is a chemistry you need. It's just like you cannot marry every beautiful person of the opposite sex. Some, sometimes there is chemistry, sometimes there isn't. I have talked to a lot of very smart people that I just absolutely couldn't connect, uh, make research with them. And uh, other times, I guess I have been lucky, there are a number of people with whom I really developed a very close research relationship. One is Jarek Nešetřil. We left Czechoslovakia together. He returned after a year using the fact that he had only student visas. And then uh, we really haven't seen each other maybe 15 years. He had difficulties travel because this one year stint in Canada was not looked at positively at the communist, uh, by the communist government. When we saw each other again, eventually he came to Canada and he uh, lived in the basement of the house where I lived. And so we saw each other during the day and also at night. And we talked about, it was a you know, time we haven't really talked to each other about research, and we talked about what we have done. And we have found uh, one topic that both of us were interested in. I had a PhD student, and I was still at Rutgers, uh, that was Martin Farber. Those of you in graph theory will recognize the name. He was my PhD student, my first idea for a topic for him was to study the complexity of coloring, graph coloring. So graph coloring is one of the basic, uh, go basic tasks in graph theory and whether or not there are efficient algorithms for it has exhibit some kind of dichotomy. If you have only one or two colors, it's easy to do. And if you have more colors, it's difficult and NP, NP complete. And so I asked Martin to look at this with respect to more general colorings, homomorphisms. And Martin was the you know, brightest kid you can imagine. And he thought about it for three or four days. And I said, this is not interesting. I, I'm not going to do that. So I put it aside. And then when Yari came and lived in our basement, I told him about this. I said, oh, yeah, I had worked on this with another student. And so we compared 
the nodes and uh, didn't seem like an important problem at the time. Uh, we were just both surprised that independently we came to the same question. Obviously, it was a deep and difficult question and, and uh, attracted us. And we worked on it basically his whole uh, semester then that he was here and then by correspondence after. And that became what is now, now both for both of us, our best known result. And we have actually accomplished that classification. So uh, the, the thing that triggered that when you asked was that he had one method of proving problems and be complete and we had another method and neither of them was enough but putting them together somehow made that work. And I had several such experiences. I don't know how we are doing on time but uh, you know this, this often happened to me that I tried to interest someone in a topic that I found interesting and they already were interested maybe in a slightly different aspect and the synergy of the two then produced something interesting and worthwhile. So, so we do have time for uh, you to tell us what, inf what uh, advice would you give to graduate students? So there are a lot of graduate students today. A very nice professor decided to bring his entire class. Uh, <laughs> um, it's graph theory, so it's a related area. Um, what would you like to tell them about starting to do collaborations or just general advice for graduate students? Yeah, so I said that the nicest situation you can have is if you have a really strong advisor and a good group of peers you're competing with. But I also say that, uh, well, I don't know whether uh, I, I can give advice, but in my experience, uh, I've always tried to function best within the existing framework. Maybe that's the effect of communist, growing up in a communist country. You, know, you can't change. I feel uh, often graduate students spend too much time on feeling unhappy about their situation, the framework. Maybe the group is not as good as they would like, or the professor is away too much, or I don't know. I, I guess my advice would be some things you cannot change, but you must do best uh, with, uh, you know, with what happens. Sometimes opportunities open, and, and you have to watch for those. So uh, sometimes you can create opportunities, but I, I myself have not been very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me describe maybe one instance of a created opportunity and one instance of uh, yes, please. advantage of an opportunity. We are okay for time, okay. right? So, um, my first position was at UBC, and uh, I had no peer group. There were strong algebraists. I was still kind of working in category theory like aspects of graph theory at the time. I went to a seminar of category theory, but hadn't really much to say with that group. and. Uh, I remember teaching an elementary graph theory course describing the graph coloring as an application in exam scheduling. So you have courses to schedule and some pairs of courses have students in common so they must be scheduled at different times and this is essentially a graph coloring algorithm. And the opportunity I created, I went to the computing center at UBC and I asked to find that person who does exam scheduling. And I said, let's sit down and look at this algorithm. And I was able to suggest improvements, you know, kind of knowing what graph theories would do in, in such a situation, really small improvements of some kind of greedy algorithm they had. And I just think with the order that, you know, tweeted the or tweak, tweaked the order in which it came. And it saved them two or three days of uh, exam. So that was a big. Uh, hoopla about it, everybody loved it. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, categorical aspects of graph theory are not the most interesting. I should look at algorithmic aspects. And uh, that's how I became kind of interested in more algorithmic sides of uh, graph theory. And then uh, the opportunity that I feel I benefited from, but they have not created was 
In another position at Rutgers, Rutgers University in New Jersey, this was late 70s, the theory of NP completeness has just kind of made its appearance. The papers of Cook and Karp and Levine have just appeared and David Johnson just became interested in putting it all together and making a book and he had the first version of the book. So he offered to give a course in the computer science department at Rutgers. I was in the math department, but that sounded really good. So I asked him if I can audit that and I audited that course and kind of changed the direction of my career. I said, oh, this is interesting. And this is how maybe most of my research uh, topics uh, since then have been in some aspects of complexity and algorithms of, of graph problems. I don't know if it answered your question, but <laughs> opportunities uh, are not to be missed, I guess, is the bottom line. Okay. So um, I think we're at a point where we can open up the questions to the audience, maybe? Yeah? Okay. So does anyone have any, sorry, sorry. Does anyone have any uh, questions for Pavel? And please use the mic because we are recording today. Okay. Oh. Okay, to oh, Matt, to Thomas first, and then to Boyan after. Hi, uh, you had mentioned how your um, parents thought it unlikely that you would be able to go to university. Was that? based on your abilities or was that due to the political situation or what was yeah. the thinking there? Thank you for offering me the opportunity to say what I <laughs> forgot. <laughs> I forgot to say that my, my father had a small business before the war and at that time you to enter a university you pretty much had to be a, a factory worker, a farm worker or a soldier or child of those two, three professions. They were the favorite three professions. Of course if you were a party official uh, or had the connections with party officials that would help. But uh, a mortal with a businessman parent has stood no chance in 59. Then in 64, it was already more possible. And, and this is how it was. The strictness of the regime uh, varied. Boyan? I was uh, always fascinated with your path to Canada. So you've mentioned you've, you've come from Netherlands and stopped in Vienna and then just stayed there. So it was like uh, you had nothing with you and you just stayed there and then uh, never returned for the next 20 years to, to your country. Is that correct or could you describe how it worked? More or less, yeah. Thank you, Boyan. So what happened is uh, we were all in military training. Uh, university students didn't have to go to the army for two years, just for one year. And uh, the other year they served during their university studies, one day a week and then maybe a month every summer. So in August 68, we just came back from a month in the army. We said we really deserve a, a treat now. We arranged for a summer job in Holland through some student agency. And on the morning of our train uh, ride to Amsterdam, the armies of the Warsaw Pact invaded and uh, there were no trains. And we basically had to uh, find our way out of uh, Prague uh, by hitchhiking. We uh, walked around Prague looking for <laughs> were the western cars lining up and there was at, at that time only one gas station that served uh, gasoline to private cars. Every other gas station was taken over for the Russian army, German army that were there uh, to support those. And so there was a long line of cars with Italian, Austrian, German license plates and we walked from one to the other until two medical students from Padua, somewhere in Italy. Uh, offered to take us and uh, it was a very adventurous ride. We uh, first took them north because we knew that the Soviet army was going south to close the border. We took them north and then made a big circle around and finally we almost got to the border where I think it was just somewhere below 
Pilsen, where uh, below Budejovice rather, where there was a barricade that people built and they were not letting the Russian army through, but they made a little hole for this little Italian sports car to, to pass there. <laughs> so we came to Austria and we had really no uh, personal belongings and we worked on ho in Holland and came back to Vienna. And then the uh, situation in Czechoslovakia was very much in flux at that point. People were going in and out, and we each risked a one-day visit. Jarek went first, he went to his hometown, he got an exit visa, which was needed at that time, and a few things that he needed, and he came back, and I saw, well, it's possible, I will do the same. And I went to Košice and, and did likewise. So for the first year, we were legally students in Canada with a permission from the Czech government and Canadian visa, student visa. And then uh, just before Christmas 1969, we got an official letter from the Czech consul in Montreal saying, all student visas are canceled, please come home now. And Yarik went and I stayed. So, um, you know, I'm not a graph theorist, so if I say something stupid, please forgive me. Um, but, but your code is computing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have seen some of your talks, and what impressed me uh, about it was there were lots of these results, but when you step back, there's this sort of full story about algorithms and complexity in graphs. It was like a, you know, beautiful story about a full research program that you can see. So I was wondering if that is, was it accidental or purposeful in the sense of having all of these results one after the other that fit together so nicely? Were you lucky or were you yeah. very smart? So, so. And uh, <laughs> I suspect both. Uh, and a sort of a follow-up question was whether writing the book helped or was that after the fact? Thank you. I would say writing the book is after the fact, but it helped. Uh, so let me come to the first part, which is kind of opens the avenue to talk about how I choose problems to work on. And uh, yeah, that has changed over the years. So I would say you probably didn't look at my early papers, which were largely governed by, you know, who I liked to socialize with. And so the often topics that were not that terribly interesting to me, but because I liked working with that person, then, you know, that more often would have resulted in. So maybe that changed when I came back from, or maybe that by the time I got to New Jersey, that has changed. And, uh, I like to, sorry? How many, years has that? How many years of my career is that? So those are the bad years. You know, I had, when I got my PhD, a very hard time finding a job. And that was a very difficult time for the job market, more difficult than it is now. And so for many years, I was in temporary positions. Rutgers was my first real job, and that was maybe seven years after my PhD. That also helped me to find a, more of a, uh, to be more selective. It's like, you know, a movie actor who takes all roles that come his way, or a movie actor that starts to select, oh, is this going to be a good movie? Maybe not. <laughs> I'm not going, to, <laughs> not going to be agree to that. And so over the years, I guess I developed, uh, at least I tried to, apply the following criteria. It doesn't always work, but I try to imagine that I succeeded working on this question and we got a paper or a result out of it. Will I be excited giving a talk about it? If I cannot see myself getting very enthused in front of an audience describing the result, then maybe it's not worth working on. And so that helps then to focus, or it helped me to focus a little bit my research on things that are kind of, yeah, kind of similar, yeah. 
Thank you. That's a nice compliment. I like that. Thank you. Pavel, let me have a more general question. If for some reason, imagine your area would not be graph theory, the complexity aspects and algorithmic aspects, um, what else do you think could it be? What would be the next best, so to speak? And you mentioned the film school, but I mean within mathematics. <laughs> Within mathematics, uh, I would say, you know, within sciences and technology, I would probably be interested in engineering, some kind of engineering. Uh, and uh, one of my daughters went that way and I said, that's good. And this is what I wanted. This is what I should have done. <laughs> and, uh, uh, also, I, I don't know if I mentioned to you, the, the, the name hell is not very common in Czechoslovakia, but there is in the town I was born another family, uh, history, in history, family hell. Uh, we may or may not be connected, more likely not. But this is the only hell family uh, in, you know, 1700, 1800 in that town, and we were the only one when I grew up. And he was an astronomer, and he was an astronomer at the uh, court in Vienna, and I think even has a crater of, on the moon named after him, and I thought, yeah, something like that, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There is a question. So this is a question that me even when I was a high school student, you know, undergrad, I've been thinking. So for people to be successful, like make a name in these research that are more mathematically oriented, is there such a notion that either you have it or you don't have it? Um, does working really hard or being resourceful really help in making a name or really do well in this mathematically related research? Okay. So that's my question. So, so I mean, should, should the students question. say, because all of these people who are successful, you see, they, they are in high school, they, can, they, they already show the talent, you know, in, in these mathematic competitions where maybe they solve the open problem. But should, the, should someone to really get into such a field if they don't consider themselves to be so super talented, but they can really work hard, they can really, you know, talk to people and it's being resourceful? Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question because it was quite long. But um, uh, he, he is asking, um, do you think that there is something that um, you have to have to be a mathematician, or can you make up for it by working hard? Yeah. I, I have very definite uh, opinion that you can make up for it by working hard. You know, your uh, question kind of reminds me of something I asked uh, to a professor uh, in one of the math camps that winning in the Olympia took me to. And I said, these, these, these talented kids from high school uh, seems so bright in math and I'm just struggling to do and, and, and he said, no, don't worry about it, uh, you work hard and uh, it will help you. So if that's the question you are asking, I have a very definite opinion that, you know, it doesn't only take the stars and the, uh, many of the super bright uh, stars encounter other problems on the way and don't end up doing this or don't end up being successful. I had a, uh, a very good friend at the first year of university. I was in awe of him. He won all the math Olympiads, like first prizes at you know international mathematical Olympiad in Moscow. And he was extremely bright at solving this kind of math Olympiad problems. So in the first year, he didn't pass analysis and you know had to repeat uh, linear algebra and then eventually he got some kind of career, but not a really great career. So. Did that answer your question? Was that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm not, I'm the only one. It's not related to this area. And I'm not a research worker, so um, I know um, during a, your long career, research career, you might have some difficulties, and sometimes maybe small, sometimes maybe a very big one. And I want to ask, um, during your career life, 
uh, research life? Uh, when is your like the biggest uh, like difficulty that you think, and I might you're like uh, maybe upset, maybe feel I can't handle this. So when this happened, how do you deal with it, and went through that? Side of uh, science? Or? Um, no. So when you went through career difficulties, um, how did you deal with? So the career difficulties I, I immediately think of was the difficulty of finding a position. Uh, I guess I maybe should describe why I felt badly about it. Uh, when I got my PhD, it was 1972. I have not heard from any of my peers or people who graduated before me that they had any trouble getting a job. I only applied to two places. I got accepted from both of them, jobs offered. One was a tenure track position at the University of Ottawa, and the other one was a visiting position at UBC. And I thought, well, UBC is in Vancouver. That's a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> the next year, there were no jobs. So that was my last opportunity to have a tenure track permanent position for seven or eight years. And uh, I, that kind of was a mental difficulty for me. I had blamed myself for not uh, really playing safer that, that first time when I applied for a position. Um, but uh, so this is where maybe uh, research on your own, not as a social outlet, but solitary research uh, helps. Because when I am upset about something and I take a math problem or a, or a problem I'm working on and I try to focus on it deeply, that kind of blocks out the other things. So it does, it, uh, if there are difficulties, it does help to, to work. And maybe research isn't the only work that that does that for you, right? I and mean, you can, if you put in, um, put yourself deeply in what you are doing, then, then you can shut out other other things. After having these job difficulties for many years, this position at Rutgers became open, and that was a tenure track position. But I still didn't want to leave Vancouver. I was still <laughs> in Vancouver. I don't want to live in New Jersey, and. Uh, then friends uh, started calling me, Vasek, Kvatal called, Ron Graham called, Fred Roberts called, said, don't be crazy, this is, <laughs> this is a real job. <laughs> so I took it. It wasn't really a, a very good job. I was to teach evening classes to adults in Newark, in the Newark campus of Rutgers. At that time, Newark was not a place you wanted to live in, especially not downtown where the campus was. And uh, there I was lucky. So Rutgers was uh, where the uh, strong group of group theorists work. This is where the uh, classification of finite simple groups was accomplished. At that time, I, w I was there. And Danny Gorenstein was the chair of the department and also headed this effort of classifying all sim finite simple groups. and. Uh, he somehow liked, heard my talk or something, liked me, and, and he said, no, you're not going to be teaching evening classes in the New York campus. You're going to get a research position on the main campus. And all of a sudden, I was on track, and I had a good job, and I was in tenure track, and I got promoted and tenured, and that was a big uh, kind of change in my career. That one person's decision to help uh, made the big decision, made the, made the big difference to me. You've described very well the, the, first, the first half of a scientific career, an academic career, and how exciting and stressful it is and getting a job and everything. So how do you keep it fun and fresh in the second half of your academic career when your security is already done? And how, how do you get up in the morning now? <laughs> I think that's a very good question. Sometimes I ask myself. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, in my case, because of all the contacts that I have already developed and established, they are after me. 
<laughs> I get versions of half written papers that I am supposed to finish and uh, I get telephone call reminders of uh, I promise to do this or that so it is a bit of a uh, rat race after all you know you have deadlines hanging over you I cannot afford to uh, take a break or uh, put it aside so I mean that also brings up uh, you know at what, what point does one decide to retire and uh, I'm sensitive to that because you know if people of my generation retire then there will be positions that all these other people are waiting for so uh, maybe that has to enter into the, into the consideration but we also I feel we have become somehow the longevity allows us to work a little bit longer I think you know maybe our teachers at this time were more eager to retire than we are I feel it's a little bit early for me you know. So I have one more question if there's a boss. <laughs> so you mentioned this ability to deal with problems in your life by doing math. Do you think that's a requisite for being a mathematician? I would say maybe yes. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe yes. That's, it shouldn't be something that you do out of obligation, but it should be somehow uh, safe safe area, a safety blanket, maybe helps. You mentioned uh, applying for film school um, and I have an impression that you actually still interested in in films and filmmaking. So what's your favorite movie and why? <laughs> yeah. I have always followed film and uh, you know, uh, I still go when I can and I help with the Vancouver Film Festival. I sometimes recommend to them the Czech and Slovak films. And I have good connections in that community in Czechoslovakia. But uh, I realize strongly that I am not a professional. Whenever I go to, you know, a film festival or uh, film school, I realized, okay, so these people are experts and I am an amateur. <laughs> but uh, if you ask me for a recent film I liked a lot, I would say a Polish film called Ida. Ida. And it's a story of uh, a, a, a woman who grows up in a, in a uh, monastery, in a uh, religious school anyway and then she discovers she's Jewish halfway through and somehow goes back to find the fate of her parents and this is a kind of difficult subject for the Poles. I, well, I like films which deal with topics that the people have difficulty facing and she encounters you know people who were hard but also people who had a soft spot in their hardness and so these kind of shades of guilt it was very well done a film is called Aida if you I think it's coming to regular theaters I saw it in a film festival yeah. It's not really a question, but uh, I, I feel it's a short story I'd like to, to share. Uh, last night I was attending an event um, at uh, SFU Surrey that has a very similar format uh, where someone got interviewed. In this case it was uh, Dr. Ken Spencer. He's a well-known legend in BC because he f uh, founded a, a company in the 80s uh, that developed very well and then um, so 20 years later or so, he sold it to Kodak for uh, $1 billion. And now he's essentially, you know, spending his money as a philanthropist, uh, giving away money to SFU and, and to UBC, uh, trying to do good things. And um, so at the end of the interview, I asked him a question. Um, 
you know, what, what do you think in, in education at university, what can we do better to prepare our students for the real life working in industry and being su successful? And I felt a bit nervous about asking the question because I thought he may come up with an answer that's hopeless that we can never do this. But to my very surprise, that was not the case. He thought for a moment and then he looked into the room and it was there were about 100 students and most of them were uh, business students. It was organized by the BD School of Business and Applied Sciences. And then he said, you know, the students may not like my answer. <laughs> But I think what was most instrumental for me being so successful in, in business life was my understanding um, of, my, of the basics of math and physics. <laughs> and so, yeah. So I think in that regard, graph theory is very helpful. Yeah, thank you. I agree. So I had a professor once who described his work uh, by saying that mathematicians think that it's computer science and computer scientists think he's a mathematician. And so um, us sort of being, doing work that uh, could be described at the same time, but you've had experiences in being surrounded by mathematicians in the math department and in surrounded by computer scientists in it. CS department, and so I was wondering if you could talk to the talk to your experience transitioning between being primarily in math departments to being in the CS department. Uh, so it's not uncommon for you know people in our area to be dismissed as computer scientists in the math department and to be dismissed as mathematicians in the computer science department. And, uh, I guess if it happens, I, I don't get upset about it. <laughs> I, I, I have had that experience and I see it especially, you know, when you are uh, judging other people's careers and so on. I always say it doesn't matter what it's called as long as it's uh, of substance, if the work is, uh, you know, has depth. Uh, that kind of enters also by, loca I mean, location enters into this. For example, in France, ever since Bourbaki, the graph theories were computer scientists by definition. There was no question of them being in the math department. And, uh, you know, in, in other places, certainly in North America, it's very common to have a combinatorialist in the math department whose main topic is the complexity of algorithms. So, are possible, we are in a, I don't know, emerging field or between two existing fields, not, not that unusual. And I'm sure people on the boundaries of other disciplines have similar experience. I was just wondering, do you enjoy being a professor and what's your favorite part of teaching? Having good students <laughs> uh, made uh, being a professor enjoyable. I am very happy that I have a student from my current class here. It's really nice. And you know, when I uh, teach a class like that or any other class and I see people whose eyes are, are bright and who are nodding their heads. That's the kind of reward that, that you're looking for. Teaching is a lot like a performance, right? It's you're on the stage, you're acting, and you like people to respond to it. So that, that was really, I would say, in teaching my prime reward. So thank you to everyone who asked questions and thank you Pavel for having this conversation with us.